Welcome to Creatively Christian, a podcast by Theophany Media, where we inspire, inform, educate, and empower creative Christians of all types. I'm one of your hosts, Brandon Hollingsworth. Today, I interview Douglas Ernst about how he came to create a comic that accurately portrays good versus evil and religious characters. Douglas also shares the process of making one of his books. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Creatively Christian from Theophany Media. My name is Brandon Hollingsworth. I'm your anchor host, and I am super excited to have with us Douglas Ernst who is a writer from the Washington Times and the creator of the Soul Finder series, comic graphic novel series. It's just absolutely amazing. Can't wait to jump into that. And so welcome. Welcome, Douglas. How are you, my friend? I'm well. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. I uh, found you on Twitter, ran across, uh, we kind of crossed paths over on Twitter and uh, watched some of your podcast interviews talking about Soul Finder, and it's absolutely right up my alley. So I can't wait to dive more into that but I would love it if you would kind of let our listeners know a little bit of kind of what was it that inspired you a writer for the Washington Times to jump into this space of of comics and graphic novels sure well I've always been a fan of comics since I was a little boy my oldest brother he would bring me on a, a an ugly green 70s type chair and he'd put me on his lap and then he would read Iron Man and Spider-Man comic books to me and that's literally how I learned how to read was Spider-Man comic books. And so I just always loved superhero stories. But then as I got older, there was a noticeable change in the types of stories that were told. And they were no longer really heroic. The heroes were not virtuous. In fact, they were usually kind of bad, nasty people. <laughs> and I didn't really like that too much, uh, considering you know the characters I grew up with who were... were inspirations suddenly were just kind of kind of jerks and so I started reviewing all of these comic books and obviously that ruffled some feathers within the comic book industry because writers don't like it when you say that they're moral relativists when they are sure and uh eventually then people would be like well why don't you write your own comic book why don't you write your own comic book and there's a lot of reasons but everything sort of came together I met my friend Timothy Lim colorist Brett R. Smith, uh, Matt Weldon is another artist. All of these guys, everything kind of came together. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to write my own story. And I wanted to write something that, again, uh, imparted values to the audience. And at the end of the day, they could feel good having read it. And maybe they would learn something about uh, my faith and uh, just a different, totally different tone than what you're getting in mainstream comic books these days. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you, you mentioned that you were reviewing comics for a while. Is that with your, your day job with the, with the, with the times, were you reviewing them there? Or were you just doing it on kind of on your own, on a blog or on a website? Yeah. For a long time I had a, I was writing a blog and it would kind of cover the intersection of uh, popular culture and politics and, all of that sort of stuff. I, I liked seeing where that all intersected. So I would cover the amazing Spider-Man, obviously. Um, and there was a couple specific writers that they were the ones that I feel that were injecting this moral relativism into the books and making the heroes kind of villains. And uh, so it was on the blog. And then eventually I made the jump to YouTube because I was like, I want to reach a, a, a larger audience. I could reach, we'll just say, a 1200 people a year per amazing spider-man review that's written but i was like if i go to youtube and i do it correctly i could reach 1200 people in a day right and so for a long time that was going really well but then the algorithm there's all sorts of stuff with youtube and uh they've changed a lot so that got kind of junky and but it worked out well because it the timing was when I started doing the Soul Finder book. So on some level, I don't even care about that anymore. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the specific inspiration for Soul Finder. It's, a, it's a kind of a unique idea for a book, um, one that I immediately hooked onto and resonated with. So tell our viewers and listeners out there a little bit about kind of the inspiration for Soul Finder and a little bit about what the actual uh, the books are about. Sure. So I wanted to have a good guy versus a clear bad guy. I was I did not like this murky grayness. 
and you, everyone's just, they don't really stand for anything at all. So I was like, okay, well, a demon is, you can't get any more evil than a demon. <laughs> right. So I was like, boom, all right, I want, uh, demons are going to be the bad guys here. And then I was like, okay, who's going to go up against this particular demon, this black fire that I've created? And then I was like, okay, well, in the Marvel comics that, that I read, usually most of the time, if they, if they actually delve into any sort of Christian thinking, they get it wrong. Uh, if they have a priest, the priest usually ends up being secretly a bad guy, uh, or he, he's constantly doubting his faith, <laughs> all of that. So I was like, okay, well, I'm a Catholic man. I'm, I'm going to put a priest in there, and I'm actually going to try and actually get the faith right so mm -hmm. if another priest or a deacon or somebody read the book oh this is theologically sound mm -hmm. so i was like that and then also uh when i got out of high school i went into the military for a few years and then i got out a lot of my friends stayed in and they you know they were in afghanistan iraq and all of those places so uh, um i have a lot of ties to the military and i wanted to honor the military as well so i'm like okay well i'm gonna have this be a priest he was a, he's a combat veteran he gets out, he becomes an exorcist, and I've created this major major order of exorcists, basically, who, uh, in order to be recruited, you have to have seen up close and personal the evil, the horrors of war, and, and come out of it with your faith intact, because physically and mentally and spiritually, you would be sort of an ideal candidate to take on uh, demons that most people have no idea, evil that most people can't fathom. Yeah, and I think that was a real stroke of genius, and that was actually going to be one of my next questions, was that the Soul Finder Order is one that you talk about. I think you say it starts it started in the Catholic Church in like 591 or something like that, and I was going to, I was going to ask, did you create that? That was, that was holy, whole cloth, something that you came up with. Is that right? That was actually a collaboration with my artist, Timothy Lim, who's actually, he's also a devout Catholic as well. So uh, I sent him the initial script, and Tim, in his longtime uh, collaborator Mark Pellegrini they love doing what they call like character bibles so they build like this entire backstory for and they know everything that's like you know I could tell you major points along Father Patrick Redder's career and his life and what happened to him but they go into like the deep history mm -hmm. and so Tim actually came up with the ex exact sort of like origin of the soul finders and he's like what do you think about this and I was like this is why I wanted you to be my artist because <laughs> sometimes if you if you're dealing with an artist and they're maybe they're agnostic, maybe they're atheist, and you have a, you have a, a script that is sort of rooted in Christianity, you're not going to be able to bounce things off them in quite right. the same way because they're just not going to see an angle of it. And I was like, well, what did you think? Of, this would be really cool if you did this. Mm -hmm. Or what about this particular Bible verse? Did you think about that? Or mm -hmm. and, and sort of all of that. So I was like, okay, it's, it's good that I'm actually have a creative team around me where everybody uh, believes the faith. Yeah. Oh, so, so many questions, Douglas. So, so, so number one, I thought it was a stroke of genius, um, the, the whole soul finders having to have some sort of, you know, military, military background, having to seen battle in the physical realm, because that kind of preps you for the, the even worse battles that you're going to have to take on in the spiritual realm. So again, just a stroke of genius there for, for both you and your artists, for the, for the characters of these soul finders. Number two, I think, you're providing our listeners some really good kind of education and inspiration here in the terms of it's really, really critical. Uh, and I, I'm, I believe this as well. And to do that hard homework is what I call it, to create those uh, character Bibles or the, or the world Bibles or what have you. Um, it's a lot of work that no one ever sees, but I really think it comes across and, and makes the characters much deeper, mm -hmm. much more realistic. So, Tell us a, a little bit about what that process was like, because that's a whole different kind of creative, you know, exercise than working on a script. That's it's right. Like, talk a little bit about that. <laughs> well, it was funny because when I first uh, I gave Tim the script, he started working, and at some point in time, he changed it, and he had changed um, Father Redder to basically a Marine. Mm -hmm. But I had come up with his whole, like, his story and his, like, units that he, he was in. And so the Marines go on different missions than the right. Army. And then yeah. I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? What, 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 you're making him a Marine? What's going on? Obviously, I'm biased. It was uh, Army. 
but it's just little thing change, but then change their entire history. The right. same who is essentially uh, Father Patrick in this, he's a veteran history. Mm -hmm. and that that also, I try to always get the major sort of points in the in the character's life and details all set and then sort of work from there. But there's a lot of research that goes into it, especially when it comes to um, the actual exorcisms and getting all of that right. Uh, like I said, I didn't want to priest, I don't want to want to be getting emails from priests that are like, what are you doing? Uh, yeah. You're a heretic or, yeah. or something like that. And I was like, I don't, so it was good when I, I ended up getting emails that were like, huh, I was kind of surprised. This is pretty accurate. And again, leading me right into my, my questions. That's a whole nother family of questions that I want to ask before we jump into that though. I do want to talk a little bit about from a practical standpoint, finding an artist that you resonate with, first of all, uh, second of all, who is in the same space as you spiritually, like in terms of, you know, your artist being a Catholic, uh, being a fellow believer, that's not an easy thing in, in today's world. So do you have some tips or tricks for if, if we do have a listener or a watcher out there who is an aspiring comic artist and they're like, I really want to work with believers. How do you seek those people out who have the, the quality of the work that you need, but also the worldview that you desire? Any suggestions? Yeah, that was a really long process. And I think sometimes it's just one of those things where sometimes like attracts like. And if you're just doing what you love. And so I was I was blogging. I was on YouTube. I was out there. And I actually met Tim through my comments section. So he started commenting on my my videos and then I would comment back and then when we ended up meeting on Twitter and then that was an easier way for us to interact view, uh, via direct message mm -hmm. and then we started talking on the phone we weren't even talking about comic books we were just talking about faith actually <laughs> and so uh, it was just sort of this like organic process where oh I finally met someone and then we became friends and then after we became friends um, we were talking about, I, I was telling him about my idea that would become Soul Finder. And he was like, well, when I was a kid, there was a GI Joe contest to come up with your own GI Joe. And I thought it would be cool if you could come up with a priest who was like the counter to Cobra's occult magic or whatever the heck. Yeah. And so like, he was like, if I could, so I, then I was like, well, it sounds like we would be a good match for this project that I want to do. And it just sort of came together. So I, I think sometimes... If you're just out there and you're putting out regular content and you're letting, and, and you're also not scared to say, I believe in God, because a lot of my readers are atheists, they're agnostics, and a lot of people on YouTube, they get a little shy about that. Mm -hmm. And I never try to beat them over the head or say, you're a bad person if you don't believe. But when it naturally would come up in conversation, I was not scared to say like, I believe in Christ, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. uh, whereas other YouTubers, they'll not, they will not say things like that. Yeah. Like we're supposed to, <laughs> you know, as believers, we're, we're not supposed to be ashamed of the gospel. So absolutely. So it sounds like being overt, number one, not necessarily a, a Bible thumper, but just being overt and open with your faith. Um, is a great, great thing to be that way. Everyone knows, Hey, Douglas is a guy who believes in God. So if I don't want to work on a project that probably involves God, Douglas is probably not my guy. Right. And the other is just to be patient. Right. So how long would you say this process took to, to get to know your artist? Was it a, a year or years or, or, or less? Yeah, I would say I met Tim and probably a year and a half, two years is when it, you know, from meeting him online to talking yeah. to him and then eventually just this again, organically coming up. But there was another project that I needed an artist for and I could not find one or I found one. And then sometimes you get artists where they might be a good artist, but you can't get work out of them. Right. You need X number of pages in a certain amount of time that, like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 I'll do it. And then suddenly like nine months have gone by and you're like, you don't want to be a jerk because you're the writer. I don't know how to draw. But then right. at some point in time, you're like, you know, it's not working out. So yes. finding a, a good artist who's reliable 
uh, that is a difficult thing. That's yes, for sure. it is. Yes, it is. I, I call that phenomenon artist flake, by the way. It's like, <laughs> it's like they're really passionate at the beginning and they're really excited and they sign up and they're like, yeah, I can do the job. And then they just kind of, they just flake off. They just vanish. They, they disappear. I've had that happen many times. And, and, and again, finding an artist that just resonates with the style that you're wanting to depict with your story, with your characters is really tough. And finding one that also believes your worldview and syncs up with your worldview, that is just a treasure. So that's something you should absolutely, I'm sure you do, but you should definitely thank God for that because it's about as rare as hen's teeth. So <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't come around. <laughs> yeah, very much. blessed to, to work with both Tim and Matt Weldon, for sure. And, and Rhett R. Smith. And are all of the, all your artists, are they all believers or just him? So, yeah, they, well, uh, Timothy Lim is Catholic. We're, we're both Catholic. Brett mm -hmm. R. Smith is sort of a, I never like pr pressed him on it, but mm -hmm. uh, he's a non-denominational Christian, I, I guess you would say. Sure. And then Matt Weldon is actually Mormon. Okay. So I've found that as well, the ability to be able to work with artists to, as, who are Christians are, is wonderful. That's a great thing. But also being open and being able to work with artists who aren't actually gives you an opportunity to, to witness a little bit. So I think that's, right, a, that's right. a great opportunity as well. So let's, let's kind of dive into the faith aspects of soul finder. I mean, we're talking about uh, a priest who, um, who uh, is uh, casting out demons and uh, who is, um, you know, obviously a really, really smart guy. So tell me a little bit about how you did research uh, into that, into that space to make sure that you weren't, um, you know, speaking a false gospel or you weren't giving some theology or doctrine that wasn't accurate. Yeah. So for Father Patrick Redder, I mean, it helps that I'm also Catholic. Um, Timothy Lim, again, is Catholic. I also had, there's another friend of mine, Mike McNulty, who's into comic books. He's Catholic. So all the, and then there was another guy who, who goes by Professor, Professor Geek, um, who was also Catholic. So I was like, okay, if, if all of us read this script and we start getting things wrong, then we've got problems. Okay. So there was all of these sort of, um, I don't know, bulwarks or some, something that could stop me from screwing up. And then on top of that, there was just uh, research that I did again into uh, exorcisms. There's books by the Father Amor, the Malachi Martin. There's the book, The Right, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then also just, uh, I was lucky enough to actually have some priests as people that were willing to you know, bounce ideas off of me or whatever, and let me know that if I was on the wrong track. So actually in, in the second book, Black Tide, I goofed and I actually made a mistake and I referenced um, the demon being eternal. And then the priest was like, Doug, no, only God is eternal. Like, the demon's immortal. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't even know why, like, my, I don't know. It was just a stupid mistake. And I was just like, I am so glad that I had a priest who, who was there to immediately catch it as soon as he saw it. And I was like, glad that didn't go to print. Yeah. Uh, I would have looked a little silly. Yeah, absolutely. That's pretty, it's a pretty close synonym, but it's right. the devil, the devil's in the details, right? So <laughs> in, right. This case, in this case, literally. So would you say those, those priests are kind of like your beta readers or, um, or, or are they just big fans or, or both? There's a couple priests. So I recently did a, a Word on Fire interview with Father Steve Grinnell. He's the mm -hmm. he's the head of, of Word on Fire. He so he originally got to see um, Soul Finder Demons match, and that was sort of my introduction to him. And then we eventually started talking on the phone. And so he grew up with uh, Daredevil comic books. Dare, the character is a, a Catholic superhero. Yep. Although again, Marvel usually gets it wrong, mm -hmm. but in the '80s at least, there seemed to be an honest attempt to portray the faith as like <laughs> normal i guess right. whereas these days you're actually like abnormal or evil if you believe in god or something along those lines mm -hmm. so i started talking to him he read the first one then i started to show him the artwork as it was coming online for the second one he read the second one and then after he read the second one he's like uh, i think we should probably have a talk about uh, what you're do you're trying to do here because like I said I have a lot of atheists and agnostic uh, readers and they like it and actually in on the first book the person who brought in the most sales for me is actually a youtuber who goes by just some guy who is an atheist mm -hmm. and he, and literally over five thousand dollars worth of sales 
on that first crowdfunding came in because came in because he enjoyed and liked the book. And it was very interesting that there were some Catholics <laughs> uh, who I thought would actually like the book and it would resonate. They slammed the door in my face. But then yep. the atheist was like, check this book out. <laughs> and it was a very strange, uh, very, I don't know, telling situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's odd. It's sometimes it's almost like with these sorts of stories, if you get it, if you get it too right for a believer, it's too, it hits too close to home, you know, and it's like, Oh, you know, I don't, I don't want that around me. It's really, it's way too convicting, you know? And so I, I think that may be, uh, you know, a little bit of what's going on there, but that's really interesting that you have folks um, that are opposed to the faith in and of itself in name who are actually out there promoting your work. That's a really hat tip to really awesome writing and really awesome art, which is definitely what's in these books, by the way, I've, I've gotten the first two and I've read them both and really, really enjoying it so far. So wonderful, wonderful work. So tell us a little bit of, about your process. So obviously you guys are working remote. Um, you guys aren't all in the same space. So how, how is your process from, hey, I've got an idea for the next book to it's in print in stores. Tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, that's actually very interesting. I consider it a... a, a minor miracle that any sort of comic book gets made because amen amen preach it <laughs> yeah you have the artist you have the writers you have the colorist you got the letter letters then you got the printing process then you got distribution and every single person they have their own lives to lead uh again i'm doing this in my spare time tim does it in his spare time people have family members that get sick there's pandemics that hit people lose other jobs and all sorts of things and so whatever you're doing has to be important enough to them to actually just make it a focus of their life. And it's basically a year long process with a 56 page book, uh, especially if you're doing hardcover books and all of this uh, to get that out the door and into customers' hands and having them actually be happy. Uh, it's, you, I would say organization is key um, and just being on the ball and how do I say, there, there's so many hats that you need to wear. Like you need to be a manager and, but you also have to be a director and a cinematographer and you have to work with people and be flexible and patient and all of these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And at any point in time, there could be a creative difference where somebody is like, I'm out, goodbye, uh, or whatever. Or even if it comes to printing, uh, our hardcovers turned out great but then there was a printing error and then i had to reprint all of my soft cover so you're never across the finish line yeah. until you're across the finish line and it communication is another one where it's key uh, you have to be very clear with people you have to have expectations set uh, be a man of your word because if you start just saying things that you don't mean then people slide off and uh yeah, it's, I, I could go on forever. There's so many different directions you could go with that question, but it, it is, you need to love the craft of storytelling if you want to do this, because then there's the financial risk involved. Uh, and a lot of people, they don't make money. In fact, most of the indie comic creators, a lot of you lose money. Yep. So it's a labor of love. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so many awesome points in there uh, for those, you know, new creators that are out there. You've got to you got to be prepared, like you said, to wear so many hats and really be prepared for the onslaught of work uh, because it is, it's, it, it is, it's a tough thing to try and get a comic book across the finish line, especially for, in the case of you, where actually you're moving into the print space and, and you're grappling with distribution. So many people just kind of say, oh, I've got a cool idea for a character and they think that's all they need to make a comic book. And it could not be further from the truth. There is so much right. work and time and effort and money. Um, and speaking of money, you had said that um, you had mentioned crowdfunding. So have you crowdfunded all of the books uh, so far or just uh, just the first one? No. The, so the first one, Demons Match, came out. We crowdfunded that. That made $33,000, which was uh, respectable, basically, considering the size of my YouTube channel and my Twitter account and all of that. Uh, that did really well. And then the word of mouth kept it. It, it had legs to it. Eventually it went up onto a, a website called Iconic Comics. And so they have the sales uh, data 
where they can see how many people are buying it per month and what's going on with that. My friend Tim, again, is on that site, Matt Weldon, Brett, all of these guys. Uh, and so I looked at the, the data from the first book and our email list that we had. And then I looked at uh, basically, or at least what they allowed me to look at, Iconics, um, their numbers, essentially, and talked to them. And I was like, okay, I think based on the reaction, I could retain X percentage of our email list and I could at least match what I did on the first book if we just go directly to this iconic uh, comics website. And then I'm happy as long as I make enough money to essentially recycle it back into the next project so that I can keep building. I don't need to be a millionaire right. or anything like that. I just need enough money to keep building slowly but surely. And then eventually you reach some sort of tipping point, I guess. And who knows what happens from there. But I, sure. I think that we're on a good trajectory. Yeah, and again, another great point for somebody out there who's looking to begin and move into this space is that don't quit the day job, right? Because you're you're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna be able to pay the rent right off the bat with comics unless it's just an aberration, right? Unless right. it's just a kind of a miraculous event. Uh, most indie creators like you, like me, like a bunch of other folks out there, um, if if you're able to make your money back and and I, like you say, put back into the next project, then that is a huge blessing. Uh, a lot of people are operating at a loss. So in terms of Iconic, um, they are your distributor. Is that right? Correct. And, and they approached yeah. you after you kind of had the, the, the Kickstarter or the crowdfunding uh, kind of already rolling. Is that right? They, they know my friend, uh, Timothy Lim. So his books were actually the first to go on their website. So okay. when we were talking about crowdfunding, the thing is, is a lot of times, <laughs> speaking of whether it's Christians or maybe even right-leaning individuals, on these platforms, they're not always, we'll just say there's populations of people that don't really want you on there. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's always this idea that you might be kicked off if you say the right wrong thing or your comic is maybe not quite what they're offering or the majority of people are offering. And so we wanted to have a fallback uh, place where, okay, if we got kicked off Indiegogo or Kickstarter, uh, there was a campaign to get rid of us because they don't like the you know, the, the Catholic comic guy or whatever, right. uh, then we have that area that we could go to. And so it, the idea was to start to slowly build Iconic. Uh, Tim comes in, Matt comes in, uh, myself and others. And if you have good books, then that becomes a gathering place of people that just want good books at a fair price. Right. And so the reputation again builds over time. And it, it's more like a five-year plan that we were thinking about and eventually it's like, okay, well, maybe we could just get where if we have to crowdfund, we could crowdfund directly from Iconic Comics. We don't oh. need to go to, you know, okay. uh, Indiegogo or whatever. And we could all just be self-sufficient <laughs> mm -hmm. and not worry about the culture that, that doesn't like what you're trying to put out <laughs> into sure. the world. Sure. And, and are you guys at that point now with Iconic or is that still something coming in the future? I don't know if uh, Iconic, at this point in time, Tim has actually had uh, a lot of success on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And for the most part, uh, the, he's actually done pretty well. Uh, so that's something that hasn't really come into play. But in terms of growing the email list, um, Iconic is doing uh, just fine. And so the thing with crowdfunding as well is a lot of people, they fund the books and then they're like, okay, well, you'll get the book in six months or eight months or a year. Right. And I didn't, I, I got sick of that. Other people don't like that. So I wanted to be able to put out a book and say, okay, well, I have a book instead of waiting eight months. How about if you wait eight days right. or five days or maybe even three days? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I wanted to see how that would work out. And how did that work out? P oh, the... <laughs> the indie comics sort of sphere that I'm operating in, they likes it because they like it because they're not used to it. Most right. of the guys, again, they're you're getting your book a year after you fund it, mm -hmm. and sometimes people forget they even funded the book, right. and it arrives at their doorstep, and they're like, "Oh, I don't even, oh, well, I don't really care about this anymore." Yeah. This is a, oh. and and so it's because you're if you're the only person, if everyone's zigging 
and you're zagging and you're actually putting out a good product, then you stand out amongst mm -hmm. this entire crowd of people. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of crowdfunders. And then there's this one guy who was like, I got a book over here. You can have it right now. Right. Then you, you attract attention. So that was another, that was my theory is that that would pay off. Awesome. Awesome. Again, great, great tips for th folks that are out there looking to move into this space. So kind of along those lines, if, if you could go back, say five years or maybe even 10 years and talk to a younger, you know, a version of yourself, is there one or maybe two um, items or, you know, uh, things uh, to go learn that you would say, Hey, this is, you got to go learn this. It's, you know, go get this book on marketing or go figure this book out on, you know, go grab this video on Indiegogo or, or whatever. Are there, is there something that you would tell your younger self, learn this and it's going to make you a better comic producer or a comic creator, uh, you know, five years from now? I would say anything that helps you become a be better team player or a, a better manager, because I've always been a writer and writing is generally a solitary activity. You just, you're alone at night in front of the computer or early in the morning or wherever you want, whenever you want to write. But then once you say, okay, well, I want to do a comic book and you start bringing in all of the, especially creative people, <laughs> uh, creative people generally tend to be a little more emotional to begin with, I guess. I know I'm generalizing here, but right. uh, once you start having like three, four five people on a creative team and everybody has their own ideas about which it could be a very good thing, but you, you're you juggling, uh, everybody has an ego of some sort. Everybody has their own idiosyncratic issues going on. Right. And so if you're the team manager, you really need to know how to manage people and not manipulate people, how to manage, <laughs> you know, right. how to manage a team and get the ship going in the right. It's a very big ship <laughs> and you can't turn on a dime. Aircraft carriers don't, they're not little motorcycles or something. Right. And so once you start going in a direction, you better make sure you're going in the right direction because you can't turn. <laughs> right. uh, and so I would say it's anything that deals with managerial issues is something to work on. Awesome. Awesome. Again, not something that most people would think about, you know, say, Hey, make me a better manager. A book on being a better manager can help me make better comics or graphic novels. That's great. So do you ever um, see any sort of crossover or cross pollination between your day job and what you're doing with soul finder? Is there ever any sort of synergy there? Not, not so much with soul finder every once in a while in my day job, something will come out in terms of a direct, you know, the Marvel movies are huge. Mm -hmm. And so if a certain director gets picked to do a Marvel movie or, you know, sometimes culturally, uh, these big name directors or actors, they will say things that we'll just say are inflammatory. And then I get to write on comic books and what they say for my day job. But in terms of um, what I'm doing with Soul Finder, it doesn't overlap. It's just after I sign out for the day, I'm done with my shift. Mm -hmm. and then it's, uh, I usually will do something involved with Soul Finder. It's either if it's shipping in international books or working on the next script or talking to Matt and bouncing ideas off of him or our printer is a API Productions, um, talking with them, coming up with ideas for, uh, so with like the hardcover books, Mm -hmm. there's all, whether you want to emboss something or deboss you want spot gloss you want glow in the dark all of these sort of things i found so for like the this for the uh the new book i've i never thought in like a million i don't want to say a million years but even something like if you have the the little like ribbons yeah for like a placeholder <laughs> um there's catalogs with all sorts of ribbons. Mm -hmm. And then even in like the binding, there's these little, um, I forgot what they're called already, but there's little things that hold everything together. There's catalogs for all of those. Right. And so these are all things that you're like, I never thought I would be going and picking ribbon number 0051A and binder hitch, or I don't even know what it's called. Right. 27, two, whatever. And, yeah. uh, but all of it goes into the final product. And if you want everything to look nice and be a nice presentation, then you got to spend time doing those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Again, one of those things that people would never think of when they're like, oh, I got a great idea for a character that one day 
they're going to be faced with that decision. So, and, and by the way, the production value on that book that you just had in your hands is really phenomenal. It's just a beautiful book. The cover is gorgeous. The pages are, they're lovely. Uh, the, the interior uh, color and gloss is beautiful. The, the little ribbon is a very nice nod <laughs> back to the Bibles, you know, right. <laughs> of, of a year. So I, I picked that up. So really really excellent job on the on the production value and that that actually goes back to like the um interpersonal people skills and managerial skills so for this one cover it has spot gloss on it but it also has glow in the dark ink as well and right. so when we were getting with the printers the the managers at the plant they did not want to do spot gloss so close to glow in the dark because if things bleed together then it uh -huh. then it's a mess and then you have a very expensive mess on your hand so right. that was another issue where it was like there's battles that you need to fight with people there's calculated risks you got to take and right. so we were just like we're gonna find a way to do this we're gonna find a way to get the spot gloss and the glow in the dark and then they did it and then they they were like whoa it worked and it's <laughs> like it worked really well and so there are all these little battles along the way and you got to pick and choose the right ones. And then when you're dealing with somebody in a plant in whether it's California or it could be uh, Tennessee or Georgia or wherever, right. um, you're at a distance. They don't know you. So how do you how do you let them know that you're a nice guy and they want to help you out and it'll all work out for everybody in the end? And uh, so be a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It boils down to just be a nice guy, uh, yeah, but also is, be firm. Yeah. Which is also the call that we have as Christians, right? So, you know, we're supposed to be firm, but also be nice guys. So it's a, uh, it meshes perfectly. So that's great. <laughs> so tell us a little bit, uh, Douglas, about what you're working on next. So I know we've got, we've got two volumes out now. Is that right? Tell us, just tell us everything that you have and what's coming next. Sure. So the first book was Soul Finder Demons Match. Second book came out, Soul Finder Black Tide. And now we're working on the third book. I finished the script last week uh, at like one o'clock in the morning. I sent it to my buddy, Mark Pellegrini, uh, Timothy Lim again. Tim hasn't read it yet, Mark has. He gave me the green light basically. And then it went to my artist, Matt Weldon. And Matt is already, he's uh, putting out pages and letting asking me how would I think about stuff. And so we're rolling ahead with the third one. Awesome. Awesome. Are you excited? Yeah, the, the third one actually is inspired in many ways by St. John of the Cross's The Ascent of Mount Carmel. Okay. And I was talking to a priest about, um, I don't think he would mind. I was talking to Father Steve Grinnell, um, uh, Grinnell about it. And he was just like, I think that you should read The Ascent of Mount Carmel. And I was like, well, I've read St. John on the Cross, but I have not read that yet. And I feel stupid. So I'm going to do that. So then I read it and I was like, oh, this is perfect. And I, uh, so I read it and that is informing a lot of the book. And so tentatively, the, um, the title for this one, will, the third one will be Soul Finder Infinite Ascent. Oh, very cool. So the, the first book kind of had, not exactly, it, was all, it wasn't an all fire theme, but there was a lot of fire as a major symbol in the first book. And in the second, obviously, you know, we're, we're in the ocean and I don't want to give too much away, but water is a major theme uh, in the second book. Do we have a similar kind of theme in the third book or is it just totally different? So the, the third book is actually a mountain theme. There's a lot of uh, basically K2, Mount Everest. Oh, People are joking. Cool. We're like, we're at the mountain level of the video game now. <laughs> um, and I didn't, I didn't actually try and work it out that way initially, where it was just, there was the trial by fire and then this sort of like baptismal sort of thing going yeah. on and going into the abyss and coming mm -hmm. out of the abyss. Right. And then this one... Um, yeah, they, they're, there's a lot of mountain climbing, and it winds up at the 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 top of a fictional mountain um, in a in a country that's near Nepal. Long awesome. story short. Awesome, awesome. Well, I am definitely looking forward to it. I am ready to place my pre order now because I I love the first two books. So I hope everyone out there who's listening will do so. Um, uh, we're going to have all of Douglas's, um, all his social medias and links and everything in the show notes. So definitely go out there 
uh, and catch all that. Um, any, any final parting words uh, before I pray us out? I just want to thank you for being willing to have me on to talk about Soul Finder. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate what you're doing with your books. I know that um, you sent me Chronicles of Faith. I enjoyed that thank as you. well. And uh, yeah, anytime you want to talk about stuff like this, then I'm game and I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes, we will definitely chat more in the future. I have no doubt. So <laughs> thank you for coming on. So let me pray for us and then I'll give you your evening back. So glorious heavenly King, we just come before you praising your name and lifting high the banner of Christ. We, we thank you so much, Father, for giving us life and for making us creative. I thank you for Douglas and for all that uh, he does for your kingdom. I thank you for his steadfast testimony and how he's overt about how much he loves you and how he talks about you online without fear. Uh, I praise you, Father, for the fact that you have brought this team together uh, of believers and of uh, people who profess you as king. Uh, and I thank you for the messages that are, that are deeply embedded and rooted in these Soul Finder books. Um, I thank you for all the talent uh, and all the hard work and all the effort that goes into uh, creating these books. I, I pray your blessings on this team, Father, um, that you will keep them safe, uh, you'll keep them healthy, that you will keep them in your watch care, that you will profit them, Father, if it be your will, uh, financially, so they continue to make more. Uh, and again, spread the, the truth of your gospel in a really cool and inventive and new way. And so, Father, I just pray if there's anything I can do for Douglas or his team, that you will make that known to me uh, without any um, confusion. Make it very clear, Father. Um, and I just thank you for his time this evening and this technology that connects us. Uh, in your son's name, we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. All right, my brother, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, for those of you that are out there listening and watching, um, stay tuned for more from this amazing guy and his awesome team, more Soul Finder coming. Uh, and we'll see you on the next Creatively Christian from Theophany Media. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much for listening today. To see show notes where we put resources mentioned in this episode, you can head over to theophanymedia.com forward slash Douglas. Creatively Christian is a product of Theophany Media. You can find out more at theophanymedia.com. This show is hosted by Brandon Hollingsworth, Andrea Sandifer, Bill Brooks, and Lynn Baber. Our logo is by Bill Brooks. Our music is by Bill Brooks and Andrea Sandifer. And remember, if you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to rate, review, and share wherever you listen to podcasts. Have a blessed day and keep on creating for our Lord.